together. We have a wonderful, wonderful treat for Sanctuary Church tonight and for all of us this evening. Powerful man of God, Pastor Javon Ruff, who was with us this past January, if you missed it. This past January, you're here, I believe, on a Friday night. Now he's here on a Wednesday night. One of these times, we're going to get you on a Sunday morning. But we'll take him anytime we can get him. He's the campus pastor for Free Chapel Worship Center in Spartanburg there with his family. But he is a powerful man of God, an anointed man of God. And let's give it to him right now. Let's give God a praise for Pastor Javon Ruff as he comes to bring us the word of the Lord tonight. Amen. Sorry about that. Come on, let's give God one more hand clap of praise. How many of you? Praise God. You love Jesus tonight? You excited to be in the house of God? Good, good, good. Well, it's just a pleasure and delight um, to be back. I told Pastor, I said, he said, what do you want me to say when, when, you go, when I go up to introduce you? I said, as least as possible. And I said, you know, I don't consider to be necessarily a guest. I'm just family coming back to visit again. And so it's just as simple as that. So because really, the only name that really matters is the name of Jesus. Isn't that right? So one more time, let's give Jesus praise and honor him. That's why we came. We came to worship him tonight and exalt him. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste any time. I want to jump right into the word of God tonight if that's okay. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to grab them and go to the book of John. I want to go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, and I'm going to read several passages of Scripture from John chapter 2. I just want to take a moment just to honor Pastor Todd and his lovely wife, the entire sanctuary staff and team. How many of you love your church and love your pastors? Come on, give it up for them. Bible said they're worthy of double honor, and I believe in it. Whatever you honor, you elevate. So don't ever forget that. The Bible says for the ones that they sit over us, our overseers, our pastors, that God gives them a grace and anointing to be the overseers of our souls, and we're thankful for the sacrifices that they make. But sometimes we don't know. We don't understand, to be honest. Um, I don't know when it comes to my own pastor. But sometimes I get to hear, or get a little glimpse of, of all that, <laughs> that they carry. And so I want to always encourage you to always pray for your pastors. You hear me? Pray for your pastors. Lift them up. Call their name out. Call their name out in prayer. Cover them. Cover their families, too. And um, it's very, very important to do that. John chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. It said, Now on the third day, Jesus' mother went to a wedding feast in, Ga in a Galilean, Galilean village of Cana. Jesus and his disciples were all invited to this banquet but so, with so many guests. They ran out of wine. And when Mary realized that she came to Jesus and asked, They have no wine. Can't you do something about it? Jesus replied, my dear one, don't you understand that if I do this, it will change nothing for you, but it will change everything for me. My hour of unveiling my power has not yet come. Verse 5, then Mary went to the service and told them, whatever Jesus tells you to do, just do it. Just do it. Nike didn't coin that term. It was in the Bible. Just do it. Just do it. How many know that? It, it, listen, sometimes it may not make sense. Sometimes it may not be easy. But if Jesus tells you to do it, what do you do? Just do it. Just do it. Nearby stood six stone water pots meant to be used for the Jewish washing rituals. Each one could hold about 20 gallons or more. Jesus came to the service and instructed them, fill the pots with water right up to the very brim. Then he said, now fill your pitchers and take them to the master of ceremonies. And when they poured out the pitchers for the master of ceremonies to sample, the water had become wine. 
when he tasted the water that had become wine, the master of ceremonies was impressed with its quality, although he didn't know where the wine had come from. Only the servers knew. Last verse, verse 10. And he called the bridegroom over and said to him, every host serves his best wine first until everyone has had a cup or two. Then he serves the cheaper wine. But you, my friend, you've reserved the most exquisite wine until now. Let me just say it like this. You saved the best for last. I'm going to talk to you tonight from this particular passage of scripture and this story here in the book of John where Jesus was invited to this wedding. And if you're taking notes tonight, which I encourage you to do, do would do so if you'd like, I'm just going to give it a simple topic and I'm just going to call it being a vessel for new wine. Being a vessel for new wine. Thank you. I want to start out by understanding that God's method in the earth has always been mankind or humanity. Everything that he is desired to do and designed to do in this earth, he uses people. I'm reminded of in the book of Exodus, the scripture said that there was a cry from the earth that came up to God from the people of Israel who were in bondage. And the scripture said the cry came up to God but then God turned around and went down to man. The cry of the people came to God, and the scripture said that he went down to a man named Moses. He didn't respond to the people, but to, he didn't respond to the people directly, but he responded the, to the people through a man named Moses. So when cries came up to God, God came down to man, and he used that man to be the answer to those cries. God has always chosen, and I can go on and on for the sake, mankind or humanity or people to be the vehicle by which he works in this earth. Understand that the God of creation has chosen to put what the scripture says, this treasure in earthen vessels. Our scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Understand when it says we have this treasure in earthen vessels or these clay jars or clay pots, God understood what he was putting his greatest investment in. What you have to understand that it actually reveals to us the difference between, watch this, the contents and the container. Because we should never confuse the contents with the container. It says we have this treasure in earthen vessel, but the earthen vessel is not the treasure. The treasure is him and we are the vessel. So we can never confuse the contents, come on, with the container. But isn't it amazing the type of container that he chose? Because when he chose humanity, the picture that is painting here, these clay jars or vessel or pots, historically were often made by it, with cheap material. Material that wasn't expensive. Material, matter of fact, that was very easily broken or very fragile. So think about it for a moment. God Almighty, the creator of the universe, when he decided of all the things that he could have chose to invest, watch this, himself in, out of all the created beings that he could have, he chose to put himself in clay pots or earthen vessels called human beings. Remember the scripture tells us in the book of Colossians that Jesus, that in him, watch this, was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so now we understand that God, by his spirit, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, comes and lives on the inside of us by the Holy Spirit. And isn't it amazing that God said, yes, I know how fragile it is. Yes, I know the inferior materials that it made out of. Because understand, on this side of eternity, these bodies break down. These bodies wear out. These bodies can get sick. Come on. These bodies can get tired. But even though, watch this, he knew us, he still chose us. And then the scripture, can I just go ahead and teach? And then the scripture goes on and said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. 
But then the Bible tells us this, that right here, watch this, that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in a large house, they're not only gold and silver vessels, but also those of wood and clay, some for dishonorable and some for honorable. Now, don't get discouraged with that real quick because actually what it's saying is that they're in a great house. A house like this would be considered a great house is filled with different vessels that have different uses. So as I stand on this platform tonight, I'm not looking at people, I'm looking at vessels. And when it says different vessels, honorable and dishonorable, let me paint this picture. I don't know about you, but my wife has this thing about 98% of the time, we eat out of paper plates. Uh, oh, so I'm the only... I'm going to go over here and see if I can find two witnesses. Anybody eat out of paper plates? Come, come on. All right. First people going up in heaven on this side. But anyway, we, she has this thing about paper plates. Because she's like, I'm not going... She says, I ain't going to be washing these dishes all the time. That's her thing. Paper plates. We even have some plastic cups. But then on certain occasions, if we have people over or company over, or oftentimes, you know, if it's a special occasion or a holiday, then she wants to pull out the nice stuff. But watch this. If I get, I'm just going to use it as an example, Pizza Hut pizza. If I put a slice of meat lovers on the paper plate, and a slice of the meat lovers on the nice plate. Notice the vessels don't change that content. Just because one's on paper and one's on, on fine china, watch this, it doesn't minimize the contents that it's carrying. But it's an understanding that one delivers one way and another delivers one way. But the goal is, is that the delivery gets out. Are anybody hearing me? Because my point I'm trying to get you to see is that in this house there's different vessels. But guess what? Every vessel has its own unique purpose. And some of us are called to do certain things. And some of us are called to do different things. But guess what? We are called to serve the same God and carry out his purpose, his vision. Come on and his kingdom plans. This is what I get, need to get you to see is this right here. God has different vessels. And let me say this, God often chooses vessels that people don't choose. The Bible said these were, it literally said this, God spoke to a man named Ananias. And he said, I need you to go lay your hands in the book of Acts, Acts chapter nine, on a man named Saul. And he said, he is my chosen vessel why is that important because I, I didn't say Paul I said Saul God imagine Ananias he's like do what who God oh, no, you gotta be joking we're not talking about the same Saul that I know God said yeah that one do you mean Saul that persecuted people yes that one you mean Saul was the one that was tearing down the church? That one. You mean Saul that was responsible for sitting around and mocking Christians and Christianity and watching people getting, getting brutally beaten, throwing people into jail, persecuting and killing Christians? You mean that Saul? What do you mean you have chosen him for your purpose? And Ananias, watch this, had to obey when he didn't understand. And the point I'm getting to you is this right here. We are not the ones that get to choose who God uses. I, uh, but we don't get to choose who God uses. God said, Jesus said, I chose him. And see, what happens is, oh, mm, 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 we often see people, watch this, in the present. But we don't know their, watch this, their purpose that God has given them. And if you get caught up in how they look now, you might miss what God wants them to actually be. Come on, somebody. And what I'm trying to get you to see is only God knows how to take an assassin and turn him into an apostle. He can take, a, come on, a persecutor and make him a preacher. Um, a, come on, a murderer and make him a missionary. And in one season, he might look like Saul. But if God chooses, chooses him in another season, he can look like Paul. And some of you can sit there and look at me like you crazy because I'm talking 
talking to you. You hadn't looked like this your whole life. In one season, come on, you were tore up from the floor up, but when Jesus Christ came into your life, he says he's my chosen one. She's my chosen one. I have a plan and a purpose. We got to be careful that we don't disqualify what God has chosen. The Bible said in Jeremiah 18 and 4, it talks about broken vessels. Say broken vessels. The scripture said that in the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel and it seemed good to the potter to make it. Here's what I want you to see. I, did they put that back? Oh, yes. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. I can see. And it said, watch this, and the vessel that he made of clay, watch this, was marred. Watch this, it was marred, but where was it? It was marred, but in his hand. And it didn't say it was marred, and he threw it away. He didn't say it was broken or cracked, and he got rid of it. But the scripture said it was marred, but still... Who told you that if you were broken, his hands off of you? Who told you if you were broken, he don't want to have nothing to do with you? Who told you that if you have flaws and, and futilities and pains and brokenness and hangups and habits and mess ups, that his hand had nothing to do with you? According to this scripture, it was marred. It was cracked. It had crevices. It had issues. It had struggles. It had stuff jacked up about it. But he didn't say, look how bad it is. It has no worth. It has no value. It has nothing else to be thrown away and cast by the wayside. If that is your perspective of Jesus, I'm sorry you have the wrong perspective of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We love John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life please learn verse 17 Jesus did not come into the world but to condemn the world but that he come on might come on the world might be redeemed through him the ministry of Jesus is not a condemning ministry it's a redeeming ministry can I just preach that redeem it means to buy back again and what I love about when something is redeemed, when he buys it back again, watch this. Uh, okay, can I go, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I go there? Because my mind is when I was at the thrift store today, and, and I was over at the mission today, and they were showing me some furniture and stuff that some of the team had, had they said, refurbished and made look new again. But more than likely when they got it, it didn't look like it did when they got done with it. In other words, it probably had cracks. It was probably missing a few knobs. But have you ever gone into a store and they had a clearance section? And they said, you can buy this as In other words, with its cracks, with its imperfections, with its knobs missing, and they'll often give you a discount. Because what they're saying, that because it has cracks and missing knobs, its value is less. And they're willing to discount it and drop the price and drop the value to get rid of it. God Almighty. But that's why I love Jesus Christ. Because when he redeemed us, we've been purchased with the precious blood of the lamb. We have been redeemed through his blood, bought back. When he bought you and I, watch this, he bought us as is. Because he didn't see us for where we were. But he saw, watch this, after his spirit and his grace and his love and his word. And he puts you in his church and surrounds you with community and gets you under discipleship. That is the process of you being refurbished, come on somebody, and being the thing that he sees you as. And the scripture said, he made it again into another vessel. I'm not making excuses, but what I love about God, he said, I made it again. And he don't just make you again once. The Bible says the righteous man falls down several times, but he gets 
back up again. I'm not condoning sin, but I'm telling you, if you fall down, you can get back up. If you fall down again, you can get back up. If you fall down again, you can get back up. His mercy endures forever. His grace is sufficient. Am I preaching in the right church to know that you can fall down, but you can get back up again? Not only did he say, I got to hurry. He talked about broken vessels. But then the scripture says in Daniel chapter 5, it speaks of stolen vessels. The Bible says that the wicked king, Belshazzar, he went into the temple of God. Are you still with me? He went into the temple of God and the scripture said he took the vessels that were supposed to be in the temple that had been, watch this, set apart for God's purpose and use. The scripture said he took those vessels out and he began to fill them the Bible said with alcohol and wine and begin to drink and use those vessels in worship unto their pagan gods. The strategy of the enemy, I want to talk to my young people, is to come into the house of God and take his vessels out of the temple. Come on somebody. And begin to fill them with the filth of this world, indoctrinate them and fill them and intoxicate them with lies. And, and the Bible said, said in these last days we'd have to deal with seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. He would wants to fill these vessels with filth and immorality and lies and ideologies that contradict this word. Steal them with addiction and steal them with bad habits and steal them with low self-esteem thing, steal them with suicide and steal them, but I'm here to tell you the devil is a liar, he let you come to the wrong service because I'm telling you God is in the business and he's on a mission of reclaiming his vessels and I don't care if you've been strayed away, I don't care if you've fallen away and I'm telling you I don't care if the devil think he has you, he is a liar, we serve a God that says I'm going to reclaim my vessels. You were not created for addiction. You were not created for immorality. You were not created for darkness. You were not created for the devil. You were not created for destruction. You were not created for defeat. You were not created to be low and down. You were not created to be insecure. You were not created to be a mockery. You were not created to be bitter. You were not created just to be overwritten with depression and anxiety all your life. No, you were created for him. His purpose, made after the counsel of his own will, you are vessels of God. Can I get three amens and I'll move on? The Bible says there's something new, unusual in Hebrews chapter 9. It said in the temple, the priest and Moses actually referred to would take oil and blow it. And he said, and put it on the vessels in the temple. I call this the bloody vessels. You know, like, oh, that's the bloody vessel. No. I only thought about that because we ain't at that place now. Just God help me. <laughs> bloody vessel. unique about those vessels they were on the inside of the temple and oftentimes they were not visible to the public eye but the priest saw them the priest saw on the inside what the people didn't see on the outside and it stirred my heart because it represents watch this vessel vessels Vessels that not be watch that may not be visible, watch this in a sense to the public, but they're visible in the private to the priest. What are you saying, Jack? Let me go a little bit better. I said bloody vessels. The Bible, the the, the biology teaches us that our Bible that our body has three different types of blood vessels. There's arteries. 
other things and then there's capillaries. The artery takes it away from the heart. The veins bring it to the heart and the capillaries connect them. Just watch this. Isn't it amazing that you can see iceberg, you can see some land, but you don't see all the artteries. You don't see all the veins and you sure don't see all the capillaries and watch what happens. Sometimes we only value what's visible. But by biology teaches us sometimes the most vital is often not visible. That's why they call them vital organs. You can't see them, but they're vital to your living. But just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not valuable. I'm, t I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm going to get there. I'm trying to get some people to see. Because even in culture and society, we glamorize the scene. We glamorize the stage. We glamorize what everybody can see. That's why we put everything on Instagram. We glamorize what's seen. We validate what's seen. And value is put on what's seen. But watch this. Let's take, for instance, me. I'm not putting those up there. Somebody set this mic that you can't see right now. Somebody's adjusting it necessarily that you can't see. When you pay, tick, pay a price to go see someone in concert, you say, I'm going to see so-and-so in concert. But guess what? The only reason why that person looks the way they look in the scene is because of the people that are on the scene. They look amazing, but you didn't see that makeup artist on stage, did you? You didn't see her hairdresser on stage or his hairdresser on stage, did you? You didn't see the person that designed that outfit and helped them get dressed, did you? You don't see the lighting technician. You don't see the sound guy. Those are all the visible. But how important is those that are in that, that are not seen make what's seen valuable. And here's my point. I took a long way to get there. Do not underestimate your value just because you feel that you're not seen in what you're doing. Because some people think, if I'm not in the limelight, I'm not doing right. But remember, it was the high priest who seen them, come on, the high priest seen in private what people didn't see in public. And that's why everything that I do, I do it unto the Lord. Because at the end of the day, listen, the pastor may not always see it. The leadership may not always see it. The volunteer, the, the volunteer leads may not always see it. But I'm going to tell you who see it. Your father who sees you in secret shall reward you open. And we could not do what we do in the visible if it not be for people behind the scenes that are not visible. I want to just make this point. I think about this sometime, I think about stay-at-home moms or, or even grandmas that has stayed at home keeping kids and raising kids and sometimes they don't feel, sometimes people don't place a whole lot of value on that but I place a huge value, I know a season in my life when I moved to California away from everything that I know, sold everything, me and my wife with a one-year-old and a three-year-old put her old career on the back burner to be a stay-at-home mom and what people are, pastor Javon, Pastor Javon, Pastor Javon. Pa there was no Pastor Javon. All you saw was the visible. But the only reason why I was able to do that, I had a wife at home. Come on, somebody. She may not have been on the stage. She may not have been up, up front, but she was at home taking care of babies. She was at home texting someone. She was at home calling someone. She was meeting someone, even with those kids, having dinner and praying over them. Do not underestimate estimate your valuable your value because seemingly you're not seen just because it's not visible don't mean it's not vital I just want to declare this right now the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 it says be steadfast hear me be steadfast immovable Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Watch this. Because your labor is never in vain. 
God sees is it all. Give God a great hand clap of praise in a moment. Now let me get to my, let me get to where I need to get. So when Jesus comes into this wedding scene, the guy said, wait a minute. You saved the best wine until now is what he said. He said, wait a minute. Normally it doesn't happen like this. He said, when the master of ceremonies tastes the miracle wine, he calls the bridegroom and he says, you, my friend, you have re reserved the most exquisite or the best wine until now. It will be you, Lord. Let me say this and I'm going to go where I need to go and I'm going to get to the point. They, they tasted something that they had never tasted before. It wasn't just he brought some wine. He said, this is not normal. This is not usual. This is not what we are accustomed to. We've never had it like this on this fashion before. I want to tell you that I believe that we are in a season and a time of new wine. I believe God is saying, I want to do some things through my people and through my church that have not been seen. That, that people have yet to taste, that people have yet to experience, that people have yet to see. I don't believe that the greatest moves of God are behind us. I don't believe the greatest outpouring of his spirit is behind us. I do not believe that all the, men, the great ministries have been established, all the great books have been written. I don't believe all the great businesses that God wants to raise up and use men and women of God to raise up and build for the glory of his name and to expand his kingdom. I don't believe that we've seen God's great. This story said he reserved it for a, for a special time. When everybody thought that they had seen it all, when everybody thought that they had experienced it all, when everybody thought that they got the good, it's got as good as it was going to get, then God steps in and says, I've got something that I want to do in this nation, in this city, in this world in 2023 that is exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever ask or dream of. Is there anybody there to believe me that I can do something new that you've never seen? before I believe the greatest moves of God will not just be contained between the four walls of a building I believe moves of God will be at gas stations. I believe moves of God will be in grocery stores. I believe moves of God are going to be on school campuses and high schools and elementary schools and college campuses and businesses. I don't believe God wants to watch this to be minimized to the mass gatherings. He's looking for individuals that will believe him. Because if we're not careful, we only think a move of God is when somebody fall down with a drunk party in the back room. I'm not minimizing that. We only think it's a move of God when it's packed to the rafters. If we only minimize the move of God to the masses, we'll miss opportunities for individuals. get stuck, watch this, on the method, you'll miss the man. That's what happened with the, with the Israelites. God said, no, I want you to taste something new. Come on. I want to taste something new. And the scripture said this. It says he tasted it and he said, this is what it is. Yeah, we ain't used to it. This, this don't taste like what we had back then. We don't, this don't, this, this, what is this? That's what it said. What is this? What is this? And it said, and many of them rejected it because it wasn't like what was. I'm telling you, I'm not talking about compromising scripture. 
I'm not talking about watering down the word. The word is the word. It's absolute truth. We don't ever change that. But if you get stuck in a method that you're comfortable with or have been accustomed to and think that you're going to dwindle God down in that little box and that minute thinking, we are crazy. Because God, watch this, is looking to pour new wine in some great vessels. And he needs vessels. Notice, once again, he's looking for vessels. I've got the wine. Listen, it didn't just fall out of the sky. Before it was able to bless people, it had to be placed in containers. Before there was a pouring out, there had to be a filling up. Quick, I'm gonna get to you. Because once they got all these vessels, oh, I need the wine for this stuff. I can't be bothered. Let the wine be poured out. What are we doing? That's why I come up here. What, what about the vessels? What qualified? What, why them? What qualified those vessels? I don't have all night. <laughs> I could do it all night, but I don't have all night. You ready? Write this down if you're taking note takers. Say number one, say nearness. The scripture said that nearby stood six water pots that were consecrated for the Jewish ceremony. Did you catch that? Nearby. The first point, what qualified the vessels? We love the wine, but what about the vessels? The Bible said they stood nearby. Number one is nearness. There's power in your proximity. Watch this. You can't, nearness means closeness to God. They were right there, close. When he got ready to do something, he didn't have to go searching. Isn't it funny that, that Moses, the Bible said this, when he saw the burning bush, the Bible said when he went near, then the Lord spoke. Could it be that sometimes God's silence is soliciting your intimacy? He said, I'm, I'm, I'm here. But if you come closer, you'll hear me. <laughs> ah, if you come closer, you'll hear me. He said, nearness. There's power. James said like this, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Watch this. We cannot walk in negligence and expect to have nearness. In other words, you can't neglect the word and be near. You can't ne neglect prayer and be near. You can't neglect worship and be near. You can't neglect being faithful to the house of God and expect to be near. Don't neglect community. Don't neglect discipleship. No, don't neglect mentorship. When God puts people in your life, God surrounds you with people. Part of that is to help you continue to grow so that you can walk in nearness. Because nearness, watch this, closeness creates capacity. Did you not see that it says these pots could carry 20-something gallons? Why did they give us a number? Because it implies they were carrying more or could contain more what the previous one did. And God said, when I get people close, I'll increase their capacity to carry more than you. I love my people. I put limits on time. I give you retirements. I give you visions. I inspire you. I fill you with wisdom. When you come close, I can call on you. Seek the Lord while you may be found. And I'll show you great and mighty things. Bible said, let me give you this and I got to move on. I love this. In Acts chapter 4, they said when they looked at the disciples, they knew they were ignorant and unlearned. But because
into their bones. They could not hear it. They were in the dark. We know those. We knew where they grow, grew up. I knew what side of the town that joker came from. I know his grandpappy. And for him to be like that and her to now live like that, there ain't but one thing. They done got near to something that's greater than them. They've been with the Lord because when you've been with the Lord, something distinct will be about you. You don't look like everybody else. And I'm not talking about your dress. I'm not talking about your style. I'm not talking about your sneakers or your shirt or your hairdo. I'm saying there's something you carry on you that people, when you get around them, they're different. Nearness. Number two, say access. Bible said they were near but Jesus had also quick access to them nothing encumbered them from him getting to them why is access important here's my question does Jesus have access to you okay I'm, I'm going to give you the scripture and I want you to let me know in Revelation they'll put it up because Jesus came to a church that he didn't, he came to one of his churches that he didn't have access to. There it is, Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and what? Well, if, it were, if, it's, if he's got to ask to open, it must have been closed. And I will come into him and dine with him and him with me. Wait a minute, he's talking to a church. See, you often hear this stuff in altar calls to lost people. No, he's talking to the church. He's saying, church not the building, my people, can I have access? Can I come in? I know you say you, you, you're saved and you're a Christian, but can I come in? When are we going to eat together? Why am I on the outside of your life? Sports got access. I'm going to preach it. You at that tournament, baseball tournament, it's got access. Softball, soccer, I'm not down in any of that, but all this stuff got access. Can I come in? Is there any room or availability for me? Is your schedule so busy with everything else that only time you need me is in an emergency? Will you give me access? Will you give me access? Could it be that somebody, watch this, if you allow God to give you access, He'll begin to use you in unusual ways. Could it be that that's why he said to Ezekiel, he said, I was looking for a man to stand in the gap. I was looking for somebody that I could access, that I could say pray to stand in the gap, that I'd hold back judgment, that I'd hold back mercy, that I'd hold some things back. He said, but I found none. Everybody was too busy. No one gave me access. And he said, because once again, he was looking for a vessel. Will you pray? Can I have access? Can I wake you up in the middle of the night? Can I trouble you on your job? Can I nudge you and say, text that person and tell them I love them? The next thing, not giving access. Are you ready? You got to hurry. Not done yet. What was it about not giving access? The Bible says this. They were Jewish. These jars were set aside for Jewish service, which is this. You ready? Holiness. It said that they were set, here's the wording though, set apart for a Jewish ceremony. That Jewish ceremony, well watch this, was a washing. It was actually like a baptism, but it was an external washing. Notice it was six pots. Six is the number of man. Watch this. It kind of represents man can only clean the out, cleans the, cleanse the outside, but Jesus Christ has to clean the inside. But it said they were set apart because that's what holiness is. Holiness is, watch this, not just you being separated from sin. Holiness is about you being set apart to God. I'm not minimizing. Don't get me wrong. I ain't. No, hold on. I'm not telling you live like you want. That is not. It does mean that. But could it be until you understand 
really what holiness is, that I've been chosen to be set apart. Because when you really embrace that, to say I've been set apart, I've been consecrated for a unique use by God. And when you understand, watch this, what you've been set apart for, you understand, uh, but also understand what I'm not to live with. Because when you understand what you are called to do, it also reveals what you're not called to do. When I understand that I've been set apart and you've been set apart, when I understood my purpose in life and my call in life, I knew it required that I had to be set apart for some things and set apart from some people. And I understood as I grown, it wasn't restriction, it was protection. Because God loves us so much, I want to set you apart. You have a special use, and I don't want your life living and live beneath what I died on the cross and shed my blood for the way that you live. I read it today in my devotion. The scripture said in the book of Judges, this mess me up. Samson's mom. God gave her instructions and said, watch this. You're going to conceive a son. She couldn't give birth. He said, you're going to conceive a son. And watch this. He said, but you shall not eat. She said, you shall not drink wine. My translation said beer too. I don't get in all that. Wine, beer. It said, you shall not touch any unclean thing. And it says, for your son, you shall not cut his hair. It says, for he shall be a Nazarite. In other words, I have set him apart for my people. This is what happened. When she, the Bible said, when she conceived, God said, be careful what you consume. When you conceive, in other words, when she became pregnant with promise, pregnant with purpose, she said, my diet has to change. I can't eat what I used to eat. Because I'm carrying something. I want to say to a young generation, you're carrying something. You're carrying something. Precious cargo. You're carrying purpose. You're carrying destiny. You're carrying vision. And when you understand that you're carrying something, it changes what you consume. You, you can't listen to everything when you understand that you're carrying something. You can't look at everything when you understand that you're carrying something. There's some crowds I'm not going to hang out with because I'm carrying. It's not that I'm better than. I'm just different from. I'm not saying I'm this. I'm just different. I've been called to live different. And so I can't consume all the music that comes. I can't consume every movie that comes. I can't consume everything on TikTok. I can't consume everything on Snapchat. I got teenagers. I know it all. I'm all up in it. Don't let me call y'all out. Any parents want to meet me at, outside after that? No, no, I'm just playing. I got two of them. I'm all in it. Last but not least, as the worship team comes. Nearness. Access. Holiness. And then there's emptiness. Notice he said, fill them up. And they came back. I know it's a spirit-filled church, and, we, and I'm all for it. I preach it like crazy. Be filled. something. The Holy Ghost just don't fill. I'm going to tell you what else he does. He empties. And if we're not, listen, you need to put just as much em em uh, uh, emphasis on filling, on emptying as you do filling. Because notice Jesus couldn't fill it if it wasn't first empty. God cannot fill a man or a woman that's running over with themselves. That emptiness represents humility. Philippians tells us, they'll put the scripture up, it says, think, think of more people more highly than yourself. Don't just be concerned with your own self, selfish ambition. He said, but this is the model of Christ. Think others, think about others, put others before you, lift others up. Is all, all you think about, some, sometimes I, I, I talk to people and they're their own little trinities, me, myself, and I. 
That's all they talk about. But it's something about when you live life to realize that real fulfillment will come when you understand that my life was designed and created to heal and to serve and to be a blessing. Jesus said in Philippians, he emptied himself of all of his divine attributes to become a servant. He humbled himself and said, I'm going to serve the very thing I created. I'm going to wash the dirt off the feet of the earth I created. He said, empty yourself. The scripture said in the book of Kings, my last reference point, is that when, they, when the woman was short of the finances to pay her dues after her husband died, the prophet didn't say, just bring me vessels. He said, bring me empty vessels. And notice there was never an oil problem. The oil only stopped when there were no more empty vessels that were available. And could it be that we're living in a time and God was saying, I got the new wine, but I need some vessels. There's no shortage of new wine. There's no stoppage. But he's saying, I need some vessels. I need some vessels that will give me access. Vessels that will be near. Vessels of holiness. Vessels of emptiness. Because he said, when I find empty, then he said, fill them up. And as you stand to your feet, this is the last point. If they can put up that last verse in John chapter 2, this blessed me, Pastor. I never saw this. I'll tell you what's at really quick, and we're going to be done. Uh, John 2, verse 9. Watch this. And when they poured out, watch this, their pitchers for the master of the ceremonies to sample, the water had become wine. I'm going to read it again. When they poured out the pitchers for the master of ceremony to sample, the water had become wine. You know what got me? According to that, it was only when it was poured that it became wine. As long as it stayed in, it remained water. But only when the vessel said, I'm no longer living for myself. It's no longer me that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's when the vessel said, I'm going to deny myself and take up my cross and follow Jesus. When the vessel began to say, it's not my will, but thy will be done. When the vessel understood that I've been created for something bigger than what I want, my agenda, there's an assignment of my call. When the vessel decides to pour out, as long as it kept in, it stayed water. Water evaporates when it stands still, but wine expands. So in other words, when you begin to pour out, when I begin to pour out, come on, things start expanding. The gospel starts expanding. Love starts expanding. Compassion starts expanding. Power starts expanding. Anointing starts expanding. When we start pouring out, that's when we will see the power manifested. But we can't keep it in. God has not called you. You sit in this church week after week getting filled up, preaching, teaching, whatever segment it is. But don't you dare sit on it. And I don't care what, listen, hear my heart. I, I don't care what age that you fall in. All of us can still do something. Listen, all of us can pour out. And don't minimize your pour out. 
If it's just hugging somebody's neck and telling them God loves you, you're pouring out. If it's just picking up a phone call and saying, I just want to call and check on you, sister, that's pouring out. Come on. When you come in here and get full of, you got multiple opportunities to pour out. And what God is saying, if you want to see new wine, let's start pouring out. I challenged myself and I said, God, I don't want to just pour out in a pulpit. But like Paul said, he said, I've been poured out like a drink offering. And he said, my departure is near. I fought the fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. That's what I want my testimony to be when it's my time. I want to know that I'm pouring out, Pastor. I didn't keep it in. I didn't keep it in. I didn't keep it in. But I poured out. I gave it all I could. I poured out for my for God first. I poured out for my wife. I poured out for my children. I poured out for the people of God. I poured out for those who are lost and hurting and broken. That is my heart's cry, to be poured out for his glory. It's the greatest thing to ever to feel when you know that you can be used by him to be a blessing to others. So tonight, here's my altar call. If you're in this room tonight and you would say, Lord, make me a vessel. I want to be a vessel for new wine. I want to I wanna recommit to you access, availability, nearness, holiness, and emptiness. I want to recommit myself to be a vessel for new wine. And tonight... I give myself to you, and whatever you desire, whatever you want of me, here I am. If that's you, that's the kind of altar call we're going to end on. we got to get out of here. But what I want to do, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to count them. And if you would say that, if you say, you know what, I want new wine. I want to be a vessel. And what I'm going to do is recommit myself to access, to nearness, to holiness, to emptiness. I want to do it tonight. When I get to three, just get out of your seat and I want you to come down to this altar and I want you to lift your hands up and don't worry about anybody else because your hands is an act of surrenderance. Your hands is, when you lift your hands up, you're making a funnel. You're saying, here's my vessel right here. Here's my vessel. I empty me and pour in one if I'm talking to you. Two, if you say this message is for me. Three, if you say I want it, come. Do it now. Come on, come on, come on. Can we sing that? Come on, come on. Make me a Come on, come on. Listen. Make come on. Listen to these words. This is it. Make me Listen. Come on. You want me to be. Yes. But I came here with yes. you. Yes. Oh, this is a declaration. This is not just a song. Come on. Jesus come on. Recommit tonight. Recommit being a vessel. Recommit being a vessel. Come on. That's it. I never felt dreamed of passion. 